What's going on, guys? Welcome to the post game live here on Dime Dropper for the 2023 24 season. Before we get started, you already know the drill. Make sure you subscribe on YouTube. And if you're on Twitter right now, please do me a favor and come to YouTube because that's where I get the most money. So please come to YouTube. I'm trying to get to 10,000 subscribers. That's a huge goal of mine. It's on my last tweet. So please check that out because I'm going to be removing the Twitter part of this in about 10 minutes. I want to gather people in, but I want everybody to come to YouTube ultimately. Live from Los Angeles, as always, Super Chats are turned on if you want to drop a dollar or a dime. Of course, you can also subscribe to my channel for the Locked On Clippers Podcast Network, the Locked On Podcast Network for all things Clippers, but of course, all things LA Sports and NBA. Almost playoff time, ladies and gentlemen, and you know what playoffs means for me. It means I'm live every night after games, so I'm going to be analyzing every game like we always do. But yes, make your way over here to Twitter, I'm sorry, to YouTube, because we got Two games to talk about tonight, both L.A. games. Clipper fans, least favorite kind of night. Clippers lost, Lakers win. Oh, man, guys, don't worry. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to unleash at one point. But we played the Sacramento Kings. No Kawhi. First news of the day, no Kawhi. I'm thinking, okay, is it just the third game this season where he's been load managed? Or is he actually hurt? They say it's knee soreness. They say he picked up something against Charlotte. Even though, again, as in classic Kawhi Leonard Clipper fashion, we didn't see anything wrong with him. He looked fine. He actually closed the game really well against Charlotte. So, yeah, I don't. <laughs> I hope he's okay. I, I don't think it was load management because he got sent home. And usually when it's just load management, they don't get sent home. But, of course, you know, Sacramento and L.A., it's about a one-hour flight. So might as well just go home. They said he's getting treatment. I mean, see, I want to believe them. But then I also don't want to believe them because I don't want anything to be wrong with him. But then I'm also like, we shouldn't be voluntarily just taking losses or risking him not playing, especially with the way Harden's looked recently. And Paul George had a groin injury a couple of weeks ago. You know, for them to play and Kawhi not, I just think that no matter how good he is, he doesn't deserve that, you know, that special treatment. But I believe that he actually, you know, had a little bit of soreness. So better decide with caution because we're going to need that dude in the playoffs. And as you can see, we're going to need him badly. We look like a joke without him. And quite frankly, we haven't looked very good without him all season long. Three and four now on the season without him. And you know what makes me wonder? Had he actually had the season that everybody anticipated in terms of missing games, where would we be? Because we got James Harden for this particular reason, to lift our floor when we didn't have Kawhi in games. And even I thought, I to be honest, I'm not going to lie to you, I was wrong about a lot of things. But one thing I was wrong about was I thought, even though I was anti-James Harden more than anyone, I thought we were guaranteed a top three seed, especially if you had tell me we had this health, I would have said it's no problem. Let's talk about the game before I get into my tirade. Man, 121 people on Twitter. Guys, come to YouTube, please. I'm cutting that off in six minutes. So please come to YouTube. The link is there for you. Anyway, Norman Powell started in place of, Sa of uh, Kawhi. Of course, the Sacramento Kings right now, they're in a situation where they need to win. A, they need to seal play in territory. They can even try to move up to six or five, and I don't think they're going to get there. But making sure that the Lakers who are on their tails don't take them out of that seven, eight, and they don't have Malik Monk and Kevin Herter anymore. So for the probably the rest of the season, I mean, at least Malik Monk is going to try to come back, but he would probably have to come back after the first round. And I don't think Sacramento, even with Malik Monk and Kevin Herter, were going to win a first round series this year. And without them, I really don't think they are. But I did notice that it seems like without those two, they have better defensive personnel out there because you get key on Ellis more minutes. And those are two of the weaker defenders that they have in the rotation, Kevin Herter and Malik Monk. So that's better, but they absolutely miss Malik Monk. I think he and Norman Powell have been two of the best six men in the NBA. Guys, in the comments, I want you to let me know who you think the six man of the year should be. I'm obviously going with Norm. I think there has not been enough talk about how great Norm has been. And again, today, he was probably our best player, either him or PG, but PG still wasn't good enough for me considering this guy's a star player. But to start the game, we had Terrence Mann on De'Aaron, PG on Keegan Murray, Zubots matched up with Sabonis. Norm on Keon Ellis, and then James Harden on Harrison Barnes. On the other side, De'Aaron Fox started out on Harden. Keon Ellis on Norm. I was kind of surprised about that. I thought they would start Keon Ellis on Harden, but I'm guessing they had Keon Ellis chase Norm because they knew we were going to involve him in a lot of movement, and that could be taxing. But Murray was guarding Paul George, Sabonis on Zoo, and then 
Harrison Barnes on Terrence Mann. And of course, both teams switching one through four. We had Zoo in drop coverage. They had Sabonis in high drop versus Harden to start the game. And to be honest, some possessions high drop, some just regular drop. James Harden actually was getting us good shots in the first half. I didn't have much of a problem with his performance in the first half. He was getting us some decent shots in the pick and roll, finding Zoo underneath. There was one time he went under the basket, scooped it to him. And I thought Zoo had a very tough first quarter. He was missing. We actually gave him the ball more in the post, which I liked. And look, he did not have a good shooting game. He missed some jump hooks that he normally makes. That's all I have to say about that. There were times where he was put in the short roll, and you can see when you make him go up, he's still a little not fluid in that floater. He's shot pretty well on it this season, but the floater doesn't convince me as much as the jump hook or just the finish, like restricted area and in. But that floater to me, it's still it's still going to need some work, and I think that's something he's going to keep improving on over the course of his career. But you saw them speed him up a little bit in the short roll. However, I think those shots he was missing around the basket, that's not an issue to me. He's going to be fine. But he was not he – was, he wasn't great on the glass either to me in the beginning. He just was having a rough one in the first quarter. But second quarter and third eh, – not, not, the third not even, to be honest. Second quarter was a good one for him, I'd say, Zoo. But just wasn't good enough from basically anyone. Outside of Norman Powell, I don't think anyone really played well enough. Russ came into the game. He made two shots, very tough shots. One was a fadeaway, and then the second one was a turnaround over his right shoulder from the foul line. But he wasn't the only one to make some shots in the first. Keegan Murray, all game long, was putting on a clinic. He's really taken a leap to me, and it's largely because I think he's much better defensively, especially at the point of attack, on the ball, physical, gotten better at moving his feet. And I can see that his we, the whole game plan for us tonight was to run him off the line every single time. And not only did he make shots, but we knew he could make threes, catch and shoot threes last season. He set the rookie record for threes in a season. He is getting better at attacking closeouts. And I thought that he made us pay a couple of times with that. And there were times where, you know, with the Kings offense, they're going to involve a lot of motion, a lot of movement, dribble handoffs and whatnot. And when you get those guys going downhill and we don't have Kawhi, who's been like our best backside rim protector outside, you know, when our centers get pulled out and we don't have anybody, there were a lot of times where Keegan Murray is catching the ball on the move, getting downhill against our defense, and we're just fucked. So, like, yeah, we needed to be a lot better to compete with this team. You know, it's a hostile environment, Sacramento. It's always a tough atmosphere to play in. And... First, what was the score after the first quarter? 24-24. It was actually a kind of a gridlock game in the first quarter. Some solid defense on both sides. I actually think our defense was pretty good to start. That's stuff I was talking about Keegan Murray, even though he was hitting shots to start the game. That's stuff I was talking about just now. That was more as the game went on. But ooh, second quarter, Sacramento put in Alex Len. They started blitzing James Harden, and they when they when when they created a turnover, it was at half court, made it an 11-point game. That's when things started kind of turning. And one thing that really shocked me, really shocked me, was Russell Westbrook being taken out of the game. Now, so quickly. Now, if you want to continue hearing what I have to say about Russell Westbrook being taken out of the game and the rest of my life, you come to YouTube because Twitter is going bye-bye, unfortunately. So come to YouTube. The link is right there on my last tweet. Goodbye, everybody on Twitter. Oof, that was brutal. I just took like 100 to 200 people out of this stream. Just messed up. But it is what it is. Anyway, so, oof, lost my train of thought there. Okay, yeah, Russell Westbrook coming out of the game. I think that was a little premature to take him out so fast like that. He was actually making shots. Okay, he lost the ball once out of bounds in the first quarter, but aren't like the way we've played Harden throughout this season like are you not surprised as a coaching staff that he looks tired the guy's 34 you have him doing all these things on the ball and you're surprised that he's tired when you played him 30 plus minutes basically the entire season like it's it's kind of crazy to me you have Russell Westbrook on your bench and you don't even really trust him to control that second unit and listen if you let me know what you guys think in the comments like if Russell Westbrook makes you like Russell Westbrook definitely makes me nervous. And in this game, he's turning the ball over. And one thing I I'm very scared when it comes to Russ about is he hasn't played defense for real in like a month plus. 
I know he was out for a bit, but like I'm talking about like a month of game time with a lot of games. He's not staying attached to the point of attack anymore like that. Off the ball, he's lost in transition off of misses and turnovers. His effort is really bad. I'm trying to make the case for him. I'm trying to advocate for more rust minutes as I have all season because I know James Harden makes me scared. And don't worry, we're going to get into his second half performance. But Russ did score a bit. Regardless of what I'm saying right now, I'm going to get in more depth about it. I'm kind of jumping the gun. But he makes me nervous. But at the same time, I thought in the first half we were pretty unfair with his minutes. Now, one guy that was pissing me off for the Kings that was making threes was Davion Mitchell. One of them was contested, and when he made it, we went down 44 to 28. Thankfully, we responded to that, and Norman Powell is one of the people that led the charge. Honestly, the main one that did lead the charge, and it's the classic Norm Powell, catch and shoot, attacking closeouts, using him on the move. There was one time where he came off a ha uh, dribble handoff or off a curl, dumped it off to Zoo for a dunk. And as I said, in the second quarter, Ivica Zubac was a lot better. He was protecting the rim well, changing a lot of shots, and they were getting with a lot of rebounds as well. And there were times where Sabonis, you know, when he catches the ball on the roll, he just rams right into guys' chests, like Giannis. Like, straight up just goes right into their chest, and it's very hard to play defense without fouling. It's a, com it's a complete advantage to the offensive players. And by the way, if you watch my Dime Machine film breakdown videos of the past, that is a complete offensive foul in the first 30 plus years of NBA basketball. So if you guys think that these guys like Wilt were ramming, if, if Wilt Chamberlain was allowed to ram into guys like that, he would have actually been kicked out of the NBA because he would have been too dominant. Like it would have been unfair. They didn't, he didn't have this privilege and he still dropped that many points. So the stuff that Sabonis and Giannis get away with is kind of nuts, but it is what it is, right? It's hard to play defense in today's game. The players acknowledge that. And, even despite that, you know, Zoo got four offensive rebounds. And in the second quarter, we only lost it by five, 32-27. But, yeah, he was still missing some chippies around the basket. Harden actually had a really good stretch at that point of making some great passes with Sabonis and drop. And at one point, I was like, okay, James Harden playing against a, a not very good drop big. He's getting some decent shots for us to get in pick and roll. This feels good. You know, trying to put Vizenkov in the pick and roll. He's not going to switch on to James. Starting to get some stuff in the short roll. Uh, Terrence Mann, good defensive half on Fox. And even James Harden, when he was switched on to Fox in the first half, he was holding his own. Now, this is where it becomes a catastrophe. The second half. This team without Kawhi is a bunch of clowns. I'm not going to lie. Without Kawhi, they look like they have no direction, no level of command. Like, where are the leaders on this team? Where are the leaders? I mean, look, Russell Westbrook, let's just address this. I'm just, In my opinion, the two biggest problems with that second half were Russell Westbrook and James Harden. But you know what? Before we get into them, let's talk about the fact that I thought Zoo was getting a little bit bodied by Sabonis. But again, Sabonis is just a better player than Zoo. I love Zoo, but Sabonis is a little better than him. Zoo still got a double-double, 10 points, 11 rebounds. But he was 5 for 14 from the field, and he was 0 for 2 from the foul line. Paul George, you know, at the same time, PG, we actually got him the ball in the mid-post a little bit tonight. And he had 18 points on 5 for 12 shooting, 2 for 5 from 3. But what the fuck is that? When Kawhi's not playing, you only shoot 12 times. That, like, Paul George, where's the level of give me the ball and get out of the way? But you know what the problem partially is? Huh. Actually, no, I'm going I'm to go for Russ first because James Harden, like, <laughs> I've been a nice guy all year. I've been a nice guy all fucking year with this dude. That I've had to... Ugh. All right, let's start with Russbrook. Russ, man, I'm trying to advocate for more Russ. You know, the energy that he brings, the rim pressure that he brings. The issue is this guy. I've said it from the start. Russell Westbrook is not a very great bench player, in my opinion. He had a little stretch in this. I don't want to say a little stretch. He had a stretch in the season where he was doing well in that role. Energizer Bunny, come in, get some points against some whatever teams. He made some big plays when he, he occasionally got more of a leash, you know, alongside James Harden to end games. We're trying to figure out what lineups can we actually use the big four in. We realized that with Zoo, that wasn't a great fit. But 
in my opinion, Russell Westbrook's always been a rhythm guy. And what I mean by that is a guy that you got to just let work through their mistakes and just get a feel of the game. Because as much as Russ will totally fuck up the game in, in a two minute stretch with bad turnovers and bad shots, when he's engaged and when he's like totally bought in and having fun. And yes, that is part of the uh, a detriment with Russ. Like it is a negative of him that there you need to kind of cater to him to really get what you need. But there's a lot of all of famers you can say that about. And James Harden's absolutely one of them, by the way. But people really thought that because he wasn't shooting as many shots that he was being super unselfish. Like this, he always wants the ball though. Like he wants to dictate. I don't understand why people got fooled on this. Russ, when he's in, he wants to dictate a little bit too. But the thing is, what we saw from Russ before we got Harden is a better sense of reflection of who he was as a player at this moment in time. And he actually was feeding Kawhi and Paul a lot, and he wouldn't get a shot happy. I feel like when he comes in as a bench player, he knows he's not getting many minutes, so he feels like he has to be in attack mode scoring all the time, and I don't like it because Russell Westbrook's scoring is far from the best part of his game at this point. I think when he's locked in defensively, he's great. His rebounding is unbelievable for a guard. His activity, when he, again, it's all about what how engaged he is, and I think a lot of that is minutes. You know what I'm saying? And it, it's it's, it's, it's tough because I don't like making excuses for players because it wasn't like he was that great out there. He made a little bit of a good push when it was garbage time, but in the third quarter, he came in and was reckless with the ball. He was 7 for 14, though, and had 20 points in the end, but two assists to four turnovers. There were times where he was driving and he didn't create any separation and he kicked it out. We got a turnover. But look, I, I just think it's been a very difficult situation for him. You know, he was basically pleaded for on national TV by his teammates and we get him and basically replace him. I don't know why Russ It's the second time it's happened, by the way, LeBron, the first time and now this, where he thinks that like this, this uh, bringing in playing with another guy that wants the ball so much and to dictate is not going to affect him. Like it is, it always was gonna. And that's why I was anti this move. And again, this goes back to Harden versus Westbrook. I think Harden's better than him, but I would want Westbrook on my team. I've already expressed this so many times. He just does intangible things that I like. I think when James Harden's one for seven, okay, man, he, he creates some good shots, but those creating of good shots is, is being le lessened very much so the last couple of months. I just feel like Russ, he has a lot of problems and he's not a very trustworthy. He's not very trustworthy. He, there's always a mistake waiting to happen with bro. But I think... When you, there are stretches, as I said, where he'll mess up the game, but then there's also stretches where he'll have his fingerprints all over the game and he'll change the whole momentum and the Russ energy, the Russ runs, they're just infectious. You know, it's just, it's hard to describe when you're in the building. It's, it's, his athleticism is just crazy, but he's not making his case much better with his laziness on defense. I'll be honest. He's not. He had 20 points, but right now it's looking like a bleak situation for him, in my opinion, in terms of like getting solid minutes going forward and in playoffs, like for real. But let's talk about James Harden. <laughs> Every year since that hamstring injury, this happens. And you know what's funny? It's like Draymond used to say it and you used to see it if you had two eyes and didn't have Harden goggles on that he would get gassed in the end of the playoffs, playing the way that he did all season long and dribbling as much as he did. Heliocentric ball. We all know about his off-court activities, how much fun he has. Not knocking that. But when it's, when it's hurting your performance on the court, I'm not saying that's happening now. That's just over the course of his career. When it sometimes hurts your performance on the court, I'm sorry, but that's not somebody I want on my team. I The biggest mistake I made was allowing every single person that was so pro Harden trade to convince me that I, I, I say I was wrong about this. I was always right about this. And I don't care that we have this good of a record. This guy is not going to win. He's a disaster right now. He's a complete disaster. He can't – look, what was that stat I posted? 12 of the last 13 games, he hasn't shot 50% or, or more. And in seven of the last 11 – he is shooting under 40. He shot 31% from three. He's not creating the same opportunities scoring-wise with his gravity or whatnot. I mean, 
Every good defender, def that defender that guards him in isolation, he cannot create space. He is not creating separation. And teams are starting to figure out that the jig is up. Stay home on the shooters. And have a, when you have a good drop big and a good point of attack guy, play two on two with Harden and Zoo and make James Harden take the in-between game shot with a guy on his hip or that floater with a guy right in his rear view. Stay home on the shooters. And when the, the ball does go to the shooters, run them off the line. Because besides Norman Powell, the other guys are suspect attacking closeouts. And Terrence Mann, love him. Let's talk about him and Amir Coffey. Amir Coffey was invisible in this game, in my opinion, on both ends of the floor. I have nothing to say about him. One for six from the field, three points. He was terrible. One for four from three. I'm never harsh on Amir, but it was not good enough. Terrence was good in the first half. In the second half, you know, he makes a three and then, actually, no, he didn't make a three. But he hesitates on an open three. And, and just like, you know, he missed one chippy around the basket, but Three for five from the field, 0 for one from three, seven points in 27 minutes, just one rebound, two assists. They're just not, there's just not enough there. There's not enough there from Amir or Terrence, but Harden, like, isn't this why we got you? He's taken the ball away from Paul George. It was all Harden pick and roll tonight, besides a couple of PG ISOs and then Russ. It's a disaster. And then the second half, he's not playing defense. He and Russ are not playing defense. They're not recovering on scrambles. They're not talking in transition. Their effort is putrid. They're not sitting in a stance. I can't believe, I can't believe I've had to be subjected to this. It's the worst, it's the biggest night. I don't give a fuck. Actually, you know what? I'm going to relax a bit because I've gotten season tickets for a playoff team and that's that's a blessing. You, you know, I am a Clipper fan at the end of the day. I got to slow down. We're still going to the playoffs and we have a chance to see Kawhi healthy in the playoffs for the first time. And if we have home court advantage, James Harden is absolutely a part of that. So it, I'm not going to say that you know, I'm, I'm like miserable and all that. I'm having a good time making content. But in terms of like us actually winning the championship, are you fucking insane? Any team that wanted James Harden, to me, it, you illegitimize your chance of winning a championship. Every time this happens and you wanted to wonder like the system and do all this propaganda in December and January, like he might recover enough for us to get to the conference finals. But if we're in the finals, I mean, I, I am going to have the longest beard ever. I, you know, I will be the most sorry person. You know what? I'm saying it right now. Times, you know, bookmark this, screen record it. I don't give a damn. If we make the finals, I will buy a James Harden jersey. You will see it. I will buy one, you know, and it's going to be next year, though, probably because he's going to, if we make the finals, he's getting re signed. I will buy his jersey if we make the finals, but there's no chance. He is, looks so cooked. He looks so cooked. He can't get by any good defender. And off the ball, he's a disaster. He does not shoot the quick catch and shoot three without hesitancy. And when he does, he's missing now. I would like to see his updated catch and shoot three point percentage now. It's not as good as last season, I don't think. He doesn't move off the ball. He constantly wants the ball, too. It's like he's not effective without it. And he's walking the ball up so many positions where he's over dribbling. I can't stand his fucking ISO package, even when he scores. He is, this is a, my worst nightmare to have the player that I least like watching on my team, the first season I've had season tickets, and I've had to convince myself there's a chance of winning with this guy only for it to come to the absolute Hollywood catastrophe that it was always intended to be. And if we hadn't gotten him, maybe it would have shown us that Paul George is a real problem and we need to go a different direction around Kawhi next year. And that's what I'm starting to lean into because after Kawhi now is shown, knock on wood, I'm still knocking that this thing, that whatever he has right now is not serious. Kawhi should not be that hurt. And if he's fine and plays 70 plus games and stays healthy in the playoffs, we might win a series. And I guarantee you, if we do, it's going to be because he's averaging 30 plus. And you know what? Even though I have some problems with him, he is the only serious championship player outside of Powell on this team. And we need to bring him back and retool around the rest because there's a retool around him and get rid of the rest, including PG. But we'll see how he does in the playoffs. But the regular season inconsistency with, the, with Paul George is becoming, is becoming very tiresome. And Kawhi Leonard, if he's showing he can stay healthy, there's no reason not to keep him. He's an amazing basketball player. He's not the leader that I like. He's not what I love as the face of the franchise. He's not very outspoken. And it's like, he's so mysterious and the injuries with him. And we don't, anytime he says anything with personality, we laugh and act like he's fucking a stand-up comedian because it's so entertaining to hear him say anything with personality. But he's such a great basketball player. James Harden, like what was, what was the fourth quarter going on with our effort, right? Letting them get rebound after rebound, walking around. Like it was just a joke. It was a joke. And, you know, the game I'm about to talk about, the Laker game was also done in the fourth, but for different reasons. 
the, 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 whole, the Lakers, the L.A. team was actually winning. And it's just sad how much of an upward direction that they're trending in compared to us. But it's crazy that they're in the plan and we're not. Just shows you how good of a run we were on. And it's like, it's crazy because we were going into the playoffs playing like that team. And James Harden was playing like that James Harden. And Russell Westbrook was still engaged on D. Man, I think we still have the second best chance of beating any, uh, the best chance of beating the Nuggets of any team in the West. But we look far from that, and we look old and fatigued. And when I say old and fatigued, I'm mainly talking about Plumber Jim, who should be scrubbing toilets if we don't make it out of the first round this year. Anyway, let's talk about the stats. Man, uh, the Sacramento Kings. Alex Len played 12 minutes, and he had four points and seven rebounds to go along with a steal and three blocks in 12 minutes. And he was plus 18, which was the highest of any player in the entire game. So Alex Len. He was pretty good. Davion Mitchell was awesome. I'm not going to lie. You know what he does on defense, but when he's hitting the jump shot, he is tough. 14 points for him, four rebounds, three assists on five for 10 shooting and four for seven from three in 25 minutes. And then you had Sasha Vizenkov. He played 10 minutes, 0 for one, two points, but he was a plus 12. I wasn't watching the game from a Kings perspective, so I don't know if he really did anything good. Trey Lyles, they got some good production off their bench. I mean, Trey Lyles, even without Malik Monk, he had 15 points, four rebounds, and five assists. One steal and one block on six for 11 shooting and three for eight from three in 26 minutes. Keon Ellis just had three points and was 0 for 1 in 22 minutes. Harrison Barnes, six points on two for seven from the field, two for five from three in 25 minutes. And then Keegan Murray, he was just spectacular, you know, hitting some shots on the move. As I said, we're switching so much, and there's that little separation when a guy switches. I'm sorry, there's that little window of daylight when a guy switches. You have that open space to attack. Keegan Murray on the move. Pretty good stuff from him. It was one and one he got. That was impressive. And that dunk he had over Zoo, oh, my God. 19 points, five rebounds, two assists, a steal, and a block on eight for 18 shooting and two for seven from three. And then the Stars, you know, Fox, we actually held him to a poor shooting game. Six for 20 and one for seven from three. But he got to the line seven times and made all seven of them and had 20 points and seven assists. And then Sabonis, definitely the man of the hour, nearly a 20, 20, and 10 game. 22 points, 20 rebounds, nine assists and two steals, seven offensive rebounds. He was really mauling us down low. By the way, they outscored us 35 to 19 in the third. But uh, he was eight for 17 from the field, 0 for three from deep, six for 10 from the foul line. You know, when we look at our stats, Zubats had 11 rebounds, but Paul George only had four. Terrence Mann only had one. Norm Powell, two. Russell Westbrook, two. Bones, uh, I shouldn't count Bones Highland. You know, Brandon Boston had four, but how many of those were in garbage time? Amir Coffey, two. Like, it's just, it wasn't enough. You know, Zoo probably could have gotten slightly more rebounds, but there were sometimes where he got rebounds over other guys, too. I don't think he was that much of the problem on that in that respect. So bonus is just, he's arguably the best rebounder in the NBA. Like I think he probably is the best rebounder in the NBA, but let's talk about our team. Uh, Brandon Boston played in this game. And I think this was actually a poor performance outside of garbage time. He wasn't great in, in any respect. He made one three at the end of the first quarter, but usually Brandon actually plays okay when he gets real rotation minutes of meaningful basketball, but it wasn't that great in this game. And again, it's tough when you're not playing consistently. It's just, his minutes have been so weird. This last, this second half of the season, we've like used him more, but he's not a consistent rotation player. So it's like, I don't really know. And then Amir Coffey, as I said, three points, one for six on the field, one for four from three in 24 minutes. He was pretty awful. Daniel Tice played 18 minutes, not Mason Plumley in this one. Three points, five rebounds on one for three shooting. And he made his only three, but did not see much from him. That was good. Russ, as I said, 20 points but only two rebounds. And there were times where he just wasn't staying attached to who he's got, who he was guarding and allowed an offensive rebound Two assists, four turnovers shot 50% from the field and 66% from three though. And a hundred from the line. So that's good. Maybe it'll give him some momentum, but like, is he really going to play meaningful minutes? Cause he was playing in garbage time. 20 points though. He led our team in scoring. And then you have the starters, all of whom play over whom played over 28 minutes. Norm. He was probably our best player in this game. 17 points on four for seven shooting three for four from three and six for six on the foul line. The guy is the most, is just the most consistent player we have outside of Kawhi and no coincidence that the two champions are the most consistent. 
keep those two. Everybody else, we'll see what they do in the playoffs. Also, although Norman and Kawhi need to perform in the playoffs, I just trust them. Terrence Mann, seven points, one rebound, two assists. I'm disappointed in my man. He still hasn't had a good defensive game. I didn't. I, I thought he had a good defensive half, but not a good defensive game in a while, in over a month. And offensively, he's been better, but he still has that hesitancy I don't like. Uh, he's had a disappointing year. There's nothing else to say about it. He has not been good enough. I don't know if part of that's p- being a slower team. It definitely is, but no excuses. He should have been better. Zubots, double-double, 10 and 11, but three and three assists, a steal and a block. No turnovers, but five for 14. He had a rough shooting game, and I think he could have been a little bit better on the glass with Sabonis, but maybe that's asking a little bit. I'd have to go back and check the tape on that. However, I think the, the jump hooks and all that will be fine. Paul George, just not enough shots. Just not enough command of the game. Just fl- just go flowing in and out, letting Harden ball dominate so much. I didn't like it. 18 points, four boards, an assist, and two steals. One turnover, five for 12 on the field, and two for five from three. Six for six from the foul line. Clippers lose 109 to 95. We're now 47 and 28. We've got seven games left. Paul George has played in 69 games this season. I'm proud of him. 70 games is going to be awesome. That's so cool to hear that Paul George played 70 games as a Clipper. I'm really used to Kawhi and Paul George being Clippers now. Russ and Harden is still weird, but Kawhi in the playoffs, it's just, there's been something missing, man. And I'm just, we need him. He He's the only reason we're serious. Like these guys are a bunch of bozos without him, to be honest. That's why they wear red, white, and blue because it's a clown show. And I'm, I'm honestly not even being harsh. Like it's just, it's disappointing. And like Ty Lue's lineup that he went with at the end of the third quarter, like small ball with Brandon, Paul, Harden, Russ and Norm, like it was just a complete, or Amir and Norm, just a complete disaster. Just a complete disaster. But, I don't know. If we win our last seven games, we only have one more road game, and that's at Phoenix, right? We have six home games to, oh yeah, we only have one more road game, six home games, and you're going to get a bunch of logs. I'm going to the game on Thursday against Denver, I'm going on Friday against Utah, and then on Sunday we play Cleveland. I'll be at all three, so you're going to get vlogs number, I believe it's 26, 27, and 28 on the season. Yeah, 26, 27, and 28. My God. Or it might be 27, 28, 29. Mods, you got to check my last video. But yeah, let's talk about the Laker game now. Uh, What do I have to say about the Clippers? Like, we need Kawhi. Without him, we're not serious. I hope that injury or whatever it is is not a big deal. And we're just, I don't want to say it was load management because we have no room for error, but Dallas did lose to Golden State. So shout out to the Warriors. That was big. I know Laker fans are pissed that the Clippers didn't win because. They weren't able to gain ground on Sacramento. But honestly, this is great because if we finish fourth, I mean, obviously I don't like it, but it is what it is. At least it's better than fifth. And then the Lakers playing the Warriors is my pipe dream in the 9-10. So one of them doesn't even make the playoffs. We have to slander someone, Um, even though I love Steph Curry. But it'd just be hilarious. Ah. I would just look if the Lakers got knocked out in the plane. would just be so funny. But at the same time, Dime Dropper would suffer a little bit because the views are great when the Lakers are in the playoffs. Either way, I'll be winning somehow, but I want one of them to get eliminated and knocked out. It'd be hilarious. It's a new wave. But speaking of which, time to talk about the Laker game against the Toronto Raptors. And there's not too much to talk about because this is a tanking Raptors team. They didn't have Scotty Barnes and the Lakers handled them pretty easily. LeBron was super aggressive throughout the game. There was a couple of there was minutes in the first half where he just kept going to his left hard drive and the way he can get to the basket still better than anyone on the Clippers at his age is, is pretty remarkable. And he made some great reads in the, in the pick and roll as normal. And it's just funny seeing LeBron play in some of these weaker teams, like with a bunch of young guys, he just toys with them. Like it feels like he can get a good shot for his team, whatever shot he wants for the team, anytime down. And Anthony Davis was getting doubled from the get go. And he still managed to score 21 points and shoot 20 times. But he still turned the ball over five times. Out, However, I think for the most part, he did the right things. Austin Reeves didn't have a very good shooting game. He had seven points on two for nine shooting and one for five from three. But I thought he did a good job playmaking, six assists, and he did a great job guarding. There was one stretch where it was just Emmanuel quickly trying to ISO and go at uh, Austin in the pick and roll. And Austin was doing a really, really good job. And his defense, ever since that game against the Thunder where he locked up SGA, has been really surprising and he's been taking the tough assignments every single starting lineup so very impressed with him max christie got some burn in this game and he produced and it's kind of funny you see it 
And my boy, uh, Andy from the Locked On Lakers tweeted about this today that Stu and Billy Mack, they kind of like silently advocate for Christie and always find a way to prop up his value because he actually does produce and he's a solid point of attack defender and the Lakers could always use more of that. I really don't know why Darvin Ham has been so wishy-washy when it comes to Max Christie. And that's one of the several decisions that Darvin Ham has made this year that I think has prevented the Lakers from being what they could be. And that's like a five seed at best to me. I don't think any higher. Um, but I mean, their, their offense is lethal right now. Like they have four guys in that lineup that can go off for 20 plus on any given occasion. AD and LeBron score 20 in their sleep. Rui Hachimura is playing some of the best basketball of his career. And yeah, it was definitely him showing some love to Cam Reddish and Torian Prince for sure. It was a little way too much favoritism for them in the beginning, but D'Lo is playing some great ball right now and Reeves as well. LeBron had a little dip in performance and then now it's looked like the last couple of weeks, maybe a week or two, he's starting to get his groove and he didn't actually shoot threes in this game. Unlike Brooklyn where he was scorching hot, he had one three point attempt in this game and made it. And I believe that was from the left corner, but Lakers took care of business. It wasn't too much, too much going on. Uh, the defense in the first half was kind of lacking though. And somebody I was kind of impressed by was Grady Dick. You know, I haven't gotten to see too much post-trade Raptors. Obviously, they're tanking. No Scotty Barnes, but Grady Dick had 14 points on 6 for 14 shooting and 2 for 5 from 3. And I thought he was impressing me with his shooting off the catch on the move. So, good stuff from him. Is there anything really much more to say? D'Lo threw some nice dimes. And AD was rebounding all over the place. Lakers went on a 13-0 run to make it 95-74 when they just kind of clamped down on defense in the second half. And, and that was it. Um, so let's read the lines. I don't really shouldn't read anything for the Raptors, but I'll give RJ Barrett his flowers for his 28 points for the Lakers. They played Jackson Hayes, Torian Prince, Spencer Dinwiddie and Max Christie in a nine man rotation. Jackson Hayes played 19 minutes and I thought he had good production. He had a very scary fall at one point. And you know, these NBA players, man, they're really impressive with just their physical. They're just physical specimens. Like this guy fell so hard from a dunk on that putback dunk. And he just got up and made a free throw right after that. And it was as if he hadn't even fallen down. Like, and he's not even that good of a free throw shooter. Like that's the crazy part. So that was impressive. And he's been looking pretty good of late Jackson Hayes without Christian Wood. He's kind of gotten the consistent burn as that second option. And you know, you know, one thing with Jackson Hayes, he's going to foul. He's going to try to dunk on someone and he's going to just play hard. Seven points, seven boards, two assists, four fouls, three for five from the field in 19 minutes. One of those makes was obviously that put back dunk and one Max Christie, 12 points, seven rebounds, three assists, two steals and a block and no turnovers on five for 10 shooting and two for four from three in 20 minutes. Talk about production. My God, that was like a flawless stat line right there. Let's see if Max Christie plays next game. Why not? Then you've got Torian Prince, who again, I really think He's been so much better off the bench. It's the role that he always should have been in. And as a starter, you just you just see more of a guy who's not a starter in the NBA. And off the bench, I think he's been really solid. And I think one thing that's underrated about him is he's actually a pretty good passer on the drive. There were a couple of times where he got run off the three-point line in this game and found somebody, whether it be on a dish around the basket or a kick out for three. And that's represented by his five assists. Eight points, five boards, five assists, two steals and a block for Torian, only one turnover, three for eight from the field, two for two from three in 24 minutes. And then Spencer Dinwiddie, one of his better games as a Laker for me. Obviously, he hasn't had many good ones, but nine points. All six of his shots were threes, and he made half of them. And his defense has actually not been bad at all as a Laker. Three blocks. So if he can just find his offense consistently, he will become an asset. But so far, it's been a little pedestrian, to be nice. Starters for the Lakers, they didn't really, really need to play in the fourth. The third quarter for them was the one they took over. Um, but in the first quarter, they actually outscored the Raptors 34-25. So they had a lead. Raptors outscored them 33-30 in the second. Then in the third quarter, Lakers outscored them 36-21 and kind of blew it open. As I said, that 13-0 run where they kind of just clamped down defensively. And their quality just started showing. Like, the Raptors just aren't good right now. They're not trying to be good. And by the way, that Jordan Nuora guy, I don't really make comments like this often, but he didn't look like an NBA player. Four turnovers, six points on two for six shooting. It was bad. Austin Reeves, I, I think I already mentioned his stat line, but I'll just repeat it. Seven points, four boards, six dimes, three blocks. Wow. 
one turnover, two for nine from the field, one for five from three. But contrary to that field goal percentage, I think he had a very good game. Rui Hachimura, he's playing some of the best ball of his career. He and LeBron have a great connection. And now you're starting to see Rui in screener actions. And whew, whether he's picking and popping, when he's picking and rolling, he can put the ball in the bucket. I mean, that's one thing I've always known about Rui. Uh, it's interesting. If you really want to go back to see what I was saying about Rui in Washington, go check out my, my lives in season one of Dime Dropper. I timestamped everything when I was talking about Russ and the Wizards consistently. But yeah, Rui... 14 points, four boards, four assists. So again, that a lot of that comes from rolling, attracting a second, uh, attracting a rotator, kicking it out to the open shooter. I remember there was one time LeBron threw it to him, fizzed it to him under the basket. He got two defenders on him, kicked it out. I forget if it was D'Lo or Torian Prince in the corner and they knocked it down. But 14 points on six for nine shooting and two for four from three in 26 minutes for Rui. And then D'Angelo Russell. Ugh. He had a rough game against Indiana, and so did a lot of the Lakers, but he's been just playing fantastic ball in the second half of the season, basically since Darvin Ham has put him back in the starting lineup. As requested by my boy Golden Knight, the ICD low background is up. Nine for 17 from the field, seven for 14 from three. My goodness. Oh, my God. 25 points, two rebounds, and seven assists. He did turn the ball over four times. If there's one negative for the Lakers, it's that they did turn the ball over too much, 15 turnovers. But thankfully for them, the Raptors turned the ball over 17 times. And the Lakers, they shot 51.5% from the field. The Raptors shot 48% from the field. But the Lakers shot 12 more field goals. And the Lakers had another solid game shooting from three, 44%. Raptors just 31%. The free throw disparity, though, the Raptors did have nine more free throws. They went 71% from the line. Lakers only 12 free throw attempts and made half of them. So six for 12. I guess that's the second con of the game. Rui missed. I'm sorry. LeBron was two for five from the line. And AD was one for four from the line. So the two stars, as well as they played, did not shoot well from the foul line. How about Anthony Davis? 21 and 12. One assist. He did have five turnovers, though. 10 for 20 from the field. 0 for 4 from 3. And I have to say, again, Anthony Davis's jumper maybe is looking a little better this season than the last three. But the jumper for him is a win for the defense. And, and him continuing to shoot threes, it's not really it. This season, he's shooting 29% from three. And it's going to go down a little bit after this game when he was 0 for 4. Last season, he shot 26%. 2022, 19%. So it's his highest three-point shooting season as a Laker since 2020. But it's, he's also shooting tied for his least amount of attempts since being a Laker. I think it's just not a good shot for him, period. He's never shot over 34% from three in his entire career. I think he just needs to be aggressive. He's shooting 55.5% from the field. Like, he's having, to me, his best season as a Laker besides 2020. And this is his career high in games as a Laker, by the way. 70 games. So I want to give Anthony Davis a hand, by the way. Everybody, even if you're a Clipper fan, let's give Anthony Davis a hand. He's played 70 games. And for somebody who gets criticized so much, street clothes and all this, after all the injuries he's been through, for him to play 70 games, that's big time. So I'm going to give you a hand, AD. I truly have always been an AD fan. I enjoy watching him play. To me, he's still the best defender in the NBA. But he's, he's been on a tear. What else is there to say? LeBron, he was awesome in this game. For me, the player of the game tonight. Uh, 23 points, four rebounds, nine assists, one turnover, 10 for 12 from the field. The dude's been on fire the last two games after a bad performance in the second half against Indiana. Two for five for the line, but good win for the Lakers. 128 to 111. They're seven and one in their last eight. And to be honest, they're playing some of the best basketball of the season. Ever since that Celtics game, they've been really good. They are seven and three in their last 10 and they're 43 and 33. But man, this West... It's the best West since 2014-15 and maybe the best West of all time if you go 1 through 11. The last four teams are pretty garbage. Obviously, the Memphis Grizzlies are very injured. And it's funny. People said this, this plan would prevent tanking. I don't see that. Although, I guess you can argue the Houston Rockets would be tanking probably now if they were – it'd be one, dif one team difference. Warriors and Lakers ain't tanking. So, the Lakers are ninth place in their 10 games over 500. But it's not the first time we've ever seen that. 2007 8 Golden State Warriors. They were a good team. They didn't make the playoffs. 14 games over 500. 
Who was the team in, two, in 2009? The Suns didn't even make it with Steve Nash damn near in his prime. Steve Nash, Amari Stoudemire missed some games and they didn't even make the playoffs with Shaq, who was still like a borderline all star. That was crazy. They didn't make the playoffs. That's how good the West was. They were 46 and 36, and Terry Porter got fired after a season. But yeah, it's brutal. It'll be fun to keep it go, keep monitoring it. But the Lakers, they're a playing team. Every year since the championship, they're a playing team. So let's just see. Let's just see. It's gonna be Lakers Warriors, and I can't wait. I'm I'm craving it. I'm craving another rematch. We'll see if they get revenge. Lakers beat them in the plane in 2021 and in the series. Can the Warriors get revenge? It would be my dream. It would be great if the Lakers just don't make the play. It's more shit to talk to LeBron stands. But anyway, that's it for me in this one, guys. Now to the live subscribers waiting patiently in the chat. Over 100 people back in the live. That's what I'm talking about. It needed a Clipper catastrophe to do it. It is what it is. Peace. When was the next time I'm going to be live? So no Wednesday live. Oh, yeah. Because like, I'm going to be going to the game on Thursday. Do the Lakers play tomorrow? Oh, yeah. Lakers play tomorrow against the Wizards. We'll go live tomorrow. Is there any big game that's worth watching? OKC Boston. What's the night game? Is there a night game? No. It's just OKC Boston. Okay, so I may just go live after the Laker game. All right. Now to the live subscribers waiting patiently in the chat. Super chat to turn on. Going to jump a dollar a dime. Peace.